Chapter 23 Gunhild found herself alone and sitting on top of a wine barrel, as the villagers either shut themselves in their houses or went to watch the battle. She followed the excited clamor and found that many villagers had gathered a short distance away from where the two lines of soldiers were marching toward each other. Some of the villagers were commenting on the action dispassionately, while others were praying or shouting encouragement. Most simply craned their necks to see what was happening, though at this distance it was hard to tell. When the two armies crashed together, the onlookers reacted with cries and gasps. "'Go on, lads!' shouted one man. The battle continued, but it was difficult to see more than a roiling crowd in the distance. Shouts from the battle carried across the fields. Only minutes after the great clash, some of the combatants turned and started running back toward the village. More joined them, and Gunhild heard all around her frantic questions and guesses at what was going on. As the retreating men neared the crowd on the way back to the village, one shouted, "'The king is dead!' Some of the villagers began to disperse quickly, hurrying back to their houses or farms, though others stood in stunned silence. "'They'll kill us all,' moaned one woman, though the man next to her shot back. "'They'll do no such thing. We grow their food. Why would they want us dead?' This sparked a flurry of responses. "'They'll take everything they can find in the village, though,' said one man. "'Our animals,' said another. "'Our daughters!' "'I'd hide any silver you have. Good advice for them that's got any silver.' More retreating soldiers passed by. Most seemed to be the unarmored spearmen recruited from local farms. A woman from the crowd of onlookers recognized her husband and waved him down, and they both hurried off together. Gunhild suddenly realized that she wasn't going to get paid for her wine. She, with many of the other villagers, ran back to Ipswich as the Mercian forces finished off any of the East Anglian warriors who hadn't fled. She headed straight for where she had left the barrels behind the king's feasting hall. When she reached them, she tried to lift one of them, and though she could get it off the ground, she couldn't walk well. She decided to roll it instead. It was awkward to maneuver, and she couldn't go very fast. Other people were running about, but they didn't seem to pay much attention to her. She wondered how many barrels she could get back to the boat before the Mercians arrived. She wondered what she should say if they caught her. Would they care that the wine was hers and that it hadn't been paid for? Would they see everything in the town as belonging to them now? A worse thought overshadowed that one. The English took slaves in battle just as the Danes did. What if the Mercians decided that all the land, even the freehold farms, were now theirs, and all the farmers were slaves? It could happen. She didn't know enough of the English to know that it wouldn't happen. She decided it was best not to risk getting captured. Gunhild managed to roll the barrel back to the dock and then off the edge of the wooden pier and into her boat. It would be a good idea to leave now, she knew, but she would be leaving with ten pennies worth of wine and leaving sixty back on shore. It was a painful loss. She looked back toward the town. No soldiers were visible yet. There were enough other people running around that she might be able to blend in. She turned and raced back toward the hall. As she ran, she heard shouts throughout the town, and soon men in chainmail began to pass her, but they ignored her. They seemed to be searching houses. She kept running, thinking all the time that she was being foolish, but still not stopping. The hall of the king, the former king, was surrounded by soldiers when she reached it. She slowed to a walk, and then looked at them and bowed quickly, and kept walking as if she belonged there. No one stopped her. She made her way to the back where her barrels were waiting, and she maneuvered one of them so that she could begin rolling it again. She heard quick footsteps behind her and turned, expecting to see more soldiers. Instead, a woman in a fur-trimmed dress holding a child to her stood staring at Gunhild. The woman was tall, with dark hair. The child, a girl, looked about four years old. The woman froze momentarily, then, saying nothing, ran into one of the storage sheds behind the hall and pulled the door closed behind her. Seconds later, three men with shields approached. One, a large man with a gold chain around his neck, addressed Gunhild. "'Who are you?' he demanded. My name is Gunhild, she said. I am one of the king's cooks. I serve Stanmar the steward. The king is dead, said the man grimly. I am Wolfnoth, and you work for me now. Are these the king's stores? Yes, my lord, said Gunhild, bowing. 
We'll have a feast, he said. Meat and ale. Is that wine? We'll have that too. What can you get ready? The butcher can have a sheep ready soon, said Gunhild, improvising frantically. Should I go see him? Yes, go, said Wolfnoth. In two hours I want my men feasting in this hall. He left, and the two men left with him. Gunhild watched them go, then quietly opened the door to the storage shed where the woman and child were hiding. Are you there? Gunhild whispered. She looked around, but saw no one. The shed was small, and there was only one good hiding place behind some bags of flour. She took a step closer. I am a friend, she said. Can you hear me? She saw one of the flour bags move. I can help you, she continued. I'm going to lift the flour bag now. She did so and uncovered the woman, who huddled in the corner with her arms wrapped around the little girl. Who are you? the woman asked. My name is Gunhild. I can get you out of here. I have a boat. I don't know you, said the woman. Why would you help me? Are you from Ipswich? I'm from... Gunhild paused. There's no time. Stay here now. Gunhild raced outside and looked around. She spotted a handcart and wheeled it back to the shed. She was about to open the door when two boys approached. They were the ones that had helped her with the wine barrels earlier. They looked at her, unsure why she was here or what they should do. Good, you're here, she said to them. Are you okay? The boys looked at each other, unsure how to respond. Lord Wolfnoth is in charge now. He wants a feast. You should get these barrels inside the hall. The boys seemed uncertain, but Gunhild seemed to know more than they did about what was going on, so they approached the barrels. Get moving, Gunhild urged. If anyone asks, tell them it's for Wolfnoth's feast. The boys complied, and as soon as they had rolled one barrel out of view, Gunhild went back inside the shed. The woman and her child were still waiting. I have a handcart, said Gunhild. You get in with her, and I'll cover you with this. She grabbed a piece of rough cloth which had been used to bundle up some turnips. I'll push you to the boat, and we'll go. Are you ready? The woman nodded. Gunhild opened the door and looked outside. The boys had returned for another barrel. She watched them take it and leave again, then opened the door and motioned the woman into the handcart. I'm scared, murmured the girl, and the woman shushed her and stroked her hair. She stepped into the handcart and made herself as small as possible. No noise now, Maswith, the woman said, and held the girl tight to her chest. Gunhild covered them with the cloth and grabbed the handles of the cart and headed for the dock. She passed the soldiers who guarded the front of the hall and nodded at them. Where are you taking that? asked one. Lord Wolfnoth wants a feast, she said. I'm going to the butcher. Your accent, said the guard. Are you English? I am Danish, she said simply. I am a cook. I serve the lord of this hall. This seemed to satisfy the guard, so Gunhild kept pushing and soon reached the docks. When she arrived, however, she felt almost sick to her stomach. Two men, well-armed and grim, guarded the entrance to the pier. She stopped as soon as she saw them and wheeled the cart behind a nearby house. She checked to see that no one was watching, then knelt down to the side of the cart. We need to get past some guards, she whispered. I will get them out of the way, and you can get in the boat when they're gone. Gunhild raised her head and looked around the corner of the house. There were actually three boats moored to the pier. It's the smallest boat. It has a fishing net. When you hear us go past, run to the boat, quietly. I understand, came the voice from under the cloth. Gunhild stood and breathed in deeply, trying to suppress the fear that boiled up inside her. Then she came out from behind the house, stood tall, and walked toward the men guarding the dock. "'Be well,' she said to them. "'Be well,' they answered. To Gunhild's surprise, they smiled, though there was something wolfish and unsettling in their expressions. "'Lord Wolfnoth asks for a feast. I trade in wine, and I need to take that barrel,' she pointed, "'to the big hall.' May I pass? The men nodded and stood aside. Gunhild approached her boat and bent low to grab the barrel. She could feel them watching her. The barrel was truly heavy and awkward, but Gunhild let it seem even more so. She pulled at it and grunted. Then she got in the boat and tried to lift the barrel up. She probably could have done it, but she let the barrel slip back into the boat once more. Then she looked back at the two men, who were indeed watching. The guards made no move to help, so Gunhild tried lifting the barrel again. She got it halfway up to the pier, then grunted and let it slip. When it landed, it rocked the boat violently. 
and Gunhild let herself slip and fall backward. That worked. The two men approached the boat, and one held his hand out to her. She made sure to look appropriately grateful. "'How is it you're a wine trader all by yourself?' he asked as he helped her from the boat. "'I used to sail with my father,' she said. "'He died this winter. If I don't sell this wine, my mother and sister back home will starve.' The two men grabbed the barrel together and heaved it onto the pier. "'It's good wine,' said Gunhild. "'They will have it at the feast tonight, I'm sure.' "'That's a fine thing for those at the feast,' said the other guard. "'We'll be out here all night, I bet you.' "'The Ereldermen and the Thanes will get the meat and wine,' said the other. "'We're having bread and beer.' Gunhild made herself look incensed. "'You should have some wine now, don't you think?' she said. She scanned the area around the dock and saw the house, behind which the handcart was hidden. "'There's no one in that house, I think,' she said. "'Take the barrel in there.' The men glanced at each other, uncertain, but then one nodded and the other shrugged, and they rolled the barrel down the pier and toward the house. Gunhild needed one more thing to make this plan work. She needed to let the woman know when to run for the boat. She thought about how she could signal her, but now that she was headed inside the house instead of past it, she couldn't think of a way. She continued to think as they reached the house and went inside. No one was there, but it had clearly been in use. There was a hearth and beds and a table. Some wooden cups sat on the table, and one of the men grabbed them while the other righted the barrel and pulled out the stopper. They poured three cups of wine and handed one to Gunhild. Thank you, she said. I wish my friend could be here to join us. The men looked interested. Who is your friend? one asked. She is my age, like me. She lives very close to here. I thought you were a trader from overseas, one said skeptically. Of course, said Gunhild but I make this trip to Ipswich often. That's how I met my friend, Iadflad. She paused to gauge their reaction. I used to be upset because she's prettier than me, but now we're friends. She would love to share some wine. One of the guards looked at the other urgently, but the other still looked skeptical. They both looked at Gunhild again, and then one rolled his eyes at the other and said to Gunhild, Yes, go get your friend. Gunhild tried to smile coyly and she stood and slipped out of the house. She ran around back, checked for anyone watching, and then pulled back the cloth from the handcart. The dark-haired woman stared back at her, silent, waiting. Gunhild made a motion to stay silent and to follow her, and the woman climbed out of the cart and then picked up the girl. "'Mommy, where are we going?' asked the girl, and the woman's eyes widened as her hand moved to cover the girl's mouth. She and Gunhild stood frozen, waiting to see if anyone nearby had heard. There were no noises from inside the house, so Gunhild motioned to the woman to follow her, and they raced all three down the wooden pier to the boat. The pounding footsteps drew out the two guards from inside the house, and one of them shouted, Stop! You there! But by the time they had realized what was happening, Gunhild was at the oars and pushing off into the river. She watched the guards as she pulled at the oars. One ran toward the town, shouting, while the other seemed intent on catching them. He raced down the pier after them, building up speed, and Gunhild could tell he intended to jump. She pulled desperately at the oars, trying to put distance between herself and the edge of the pier. The guard didn't break his stride. He hit the edge of the pier and launched himself at the boat. He missed by only a few feet, and the splash from his landing soaked Gunhild and made a wave that pushed the boat further on. Had he not been wearing mail, he might have tried to swim after the boat, but as it was, he had no choice but to struggle back to shore. With only a few more pulls at the oars, Gunhild and her two passengers left Ipswich in the distance. They all remained silent as Gunhild rowed. Eventually, she pulled in the oars and ran up the sail. It was dark now, but she kept sailing, hoping to put as much distance between them and the town as possible. Eventually, the woman set the child down in the boat and spoke. Thank you, she said. My name is Sawin, and this is my daughter Maswith. You're welcome, said Gunhild. Why were they after you? Ransom, I assume, said Sawin. My husband is Bjartstan, Thane to King Yadman. She paused, and a sob shook her. Oh, God, she said. He's dead, of course. They all must be. She clutched Maswith close and tried to hold back tears. Maswith seemed confused, but she clung tightly to her mother. Gunhild turned to look over her shoulder to make sure no other boat was following in the distance. 
Sawin struggled to compose herself, then continued. My father is Athelrich, thane to King Erdwulf of Northumbria, also an enemy of the Mercians. They could have ransomed me back to my father, or held me hostage so that my father would refuse to keep fighting, or killed me to punish Northumbria. Who knows? Where should I take you? asked Gunhild. Sawin seemed about to answer, but asked instead, Why are you helping me? Who are you? Gunhild smiled. I saw you were in trouble. I had to help. She wished her English was better so she could explain more, but when she reflected upon it later, she realized that the answer was, in fact, that simple. I am a traitor, Gunhild continued. I was heading north with wine I bought in Doristad. North is good, said Sawin. The Overwitch should be safe. I know people there. They can send word to my father. What about Daddy? asked Maswith. Sawin looked down at her pityingly. Gunhild listened as Sawin did her best to explain that Maswith's father had died in battle, but it was confusing to Maswith, and Sawin had to explain three times before Maswith started to understand. After that, Maswith said she was hungry, and Gunhild gave her a sausage, which Maswith finished half of before falling asleep. Gunhild kept sailing until they left the river and turned north along the shoreline. It was the middle of the night by the time they stopped, and Gunhild couldn't see too well, as the moon was only at its quarter. But she felt better knowing that if they were being pursued, the Mercians would not know whether they were headed north or south. She dragged the boat up the beach while Salwyn carried Maswith, and they slept that night without a campfire. The three of them continued north, and no boat ever appeared behind them. Gunhild caught fish and cooked them as they went, and she was able to refill her water skin at a stream they passed. The weather held, and the journey was easy. Salwin kept up a stoic resolve and didn't shy away from collecting sticks for the fire or helping cook the fish. She even took a turn at steering the boat when Gunhild offered. Her fine clothes were soon wet and dirty, but she never complained. Gunhild had half expected a woman with a fur-trimmed dress and gold cloak pin to object to working at all. As they traveled, Maswith continued to ask questions, often about where they were going and what had happened to her father. She asked her mother who the big girl was at least twice, and once asked why she talked so funny. I'm from a place far away, explained Gunhild. I'm still learning to speak English. I can teach you, offered Maswith kindly. Wait, what's English? That's what you speak, dear, her mother explained. Having established that Gunhild was a safe person, Maswith chatted with her throughout the journey. She was filled with questions about everything, the boat, the sea, the weather. She asked about fish and where they came from, and the waves and why they moved. She asked why trees were on land and not in the water. Gunhild kept up as best she could. Do you have a mummy and a daddy? Maswith asked. I do, said Gunhild. My mother lives on a farm. My father is dead. Your father is dead? said Maswith. Yes. Why is he dead? He died fighting said Gunhild. Oh, like my daddy? Yes, said Gunhild. Why? The question hung in the air. Gunhild glanced at Sawin, but Sawin had no answer. Who else do you have? asked Maswith. I'm sorry, I don't understand, said Gunhild. Maswith clarified. If you have a mummy and a daddy, who else do you have? Oh, I have two brothers and an aunt and another aunt and an uncle, and cousins, said Gunhild. And I have a friend. What is your friend's name? Yadith, said Gunhild.
Within a week they spotted the stone church on the spit of land that marked the mouth of the Humber. As they crossed from sea to river, Gunhild noticed Samhain watching the stone church. The last time I saw that church, I was going south to marry Bjortstan, said Samhain. She means daddy, Maswith explained. How did you meet him? asked Gunhild. I met him the day we married, Samhain answered. My father met Bjortstan when he came north to renew an alliance with Northumbria. They made the match. I married the following spring, and I haven't been back since. Were you sad to leave your home? At the time I was excited, said Samhain. I was going to be a wife, the head of a household. Then I reached the village in the hall and saw Bjortstan for the first time, and I was suddenly terrified. Scared of Daddy? Maswith asked. Scared because it was so new, her mother said. But the moment he saw me and realized I had arrived for the wedding, he smiled this huge smile, like I was the most wonderful thing he had ever seen. I think I fell in love as soon as I saw his smile. Samhain dabbed away some tears. Daddy died in battle, said Maswith knowingly. That's true, said Gunhild. I'm very sorry about that. And your daddy died in battle, too. Yes, said Gunhild. Tell me something you loved about your father. He let me ride his horse, shouted Maswith. It was so big, and he put me on top, and we walked and walked. My favorite thing to remember about my father is how he told stories, said Gunhild. He always had a story ready whenever I asked. Can you tell me one? asked Maswith. Certainly, said Gunhild. Let me think. Here's one my brother used to love. This is a story about Thor. Who is Thor? The people where I come from say that Thor is one of the gods. He lives in Osgarth. He has red hair and a red beard, and he rides in a chariot pulled by goats. Maswith thought this was hilarious. One day Thor needed food for a feast, so he and a giant named Humir went fishing. A giant? gasped Maswith, and her eyes lit up with excitement. Yes, said Gunhild. Thor took the head of an ox to use as bait because they wanted to catch something really big. Humir caught two whales, but Thor didn't catch anything. Thor was getting mad, so he rowed the boat even farther out to sea, and Humir said, No, don't go too far. The serpent Jormungand lives out here. Jormungand is the world serpent, so big he wraps all the way around the ocean. He is so big that when he gets angry, the earth shakes. Homir told Thor to be careful, but Thor wanted something big for the feast, so he put the ox's head on his hook and threw it in. There was a bite and a pull, and the boat started to wobble. At this, Gunhild rocked the boat slightly for effect. Maswith clutched the side of the boat and giggled. Thor began to pull and pull, Gunhild continued, and then out of the water came the head of the giant serpent. It had huge teeth. Thor pulled at the line, and he looked right into the eye of Jormungand. You're going to sink the boat, cried Humir, but Thor wouldn't give up, and the boat started to lean over to the side and sink lower and lower in the water. Finally, as Thor was about to pull Jormungand's head into the boat, Humir took his knife and cut the line, and the giant serpent swam away. Thor was so mad that he threw Humir into the water and made him swim home. They ate the two whales for the feast that night, but Jormungand didn't forget what happened, and he is waiting for another chance to battle against Thor. Maswith was delighted at the story. Thank you, Gunhild, said Samhain, smiling. Is Thor real, mummy? asked Maswith. It's just a story, dear, said Samhain. Gunhild wondered what she would have said if Maswith had asked her. It had been almost a year since she had even heard the names of Thor or any of the gods. Yet the crops grew in England without sacrifices to Frey, and women had babies without any help from Freya. All the same, the Danes got along quite well without the English god. It was perplexing. It was not long until they reached Eoverwich. Gunhild spotted the walls from a distance and suggested that they pull up to the river bank because none of them had any money to pay the toll, but Samhain insisted that that would be unnecessary. Gunhild rode past the walls and into the town and up to one of the piers, and to her surprise a man motioned to her to throw him the rope. 
She did, and the man pulled them in and hitched the boat to a post, then bowed to Sawan and helped her and Mousewith out of the boat. He didn't help Gunhild, but he didn't charge them anything either. The man escorted Sawan as far as the edge of the pier, then bowed again as she left, and Sawan, carrying Mousewith, made her way past tents and houses to the great hall with the carved door. Gunhild followed behind and watched in amazement as people stepped out of the way respectfully to let Sawin pass. When they reached the hall, the guard opened it for her and bowed. Gunhild looked around for an indication of whether she was supposed to follow. The guard nodded to her, and she went inside. It was much like the hall where she had played for Almer and Edmund. The ceiling was thatch, but high, supported by large timber struts. Two fires burned in two hearths. At one, two men with swords sat and talked. At the other, further back, a woman cooked. Platforms with cushions and furs lined the edge of the hall, and windows let in light and air. Fifty men could have fit inside without the hall seeming too full. Upon seeing Sawen and Maswith, the two men stood and greeted them. Gunhild recognized one of the men as the one who had bought her lyre. Sawen hugged him and took the other man by the hand. Gunhild stood back, so she didn't catch all of the conversation, but after a moment Sawen turned to her and beckoned. Gunhild approached and tried not to act nervous. This is Gunhild, Maswith told the men. She has a boat. Both men thanked Gunhild for her help, and Sawin explained to her that they would send for her father. Thank you again, she said. I owe you my life. The two men had gone back to talking, but Sawin interrupted them. She inclined her head meaningfully toward Gunhild, and one of the men, understanding, went to a chest and returned with a small cloth bag. He placed it in Gunhild's hand, smiled, and then turned back to his conversation. Safe travels, said Sawin, and just as Gunhild was about to go, Maswith ran up and hugged her around the legs. Gunhild said her goodbyes and retreated out of the hall, and paused outside to catch her breath and figure out what to do next. She walked back toward the large stone church and sat down in its shade. She still had the cloth bag in her hand, and through the fabric she could feel a small handful of coins. It felt like ten or twelve pennies, which could at least get her some food and supplies and a small cargo if she decided on another expedition. However, she hadn't decided what to do next or where to go. She poured the coins into her hand to count them and gasped at what she saw. They were gold. She quickly closed her hand and looked around. No one else had seen. She opened her fingers surreptitiously and counted ten coins. She wasn't sure how many pennies that would be equivalent to, but she figured she had recovered the value of her lost wine three or four times over. With this much money, she could go anywhere. Her stomach growled, and she realized that she hadn't eaten all day. That presented a further problem. One gold coin might buy her a whole cow, but she had no easy way to buy a meal. She put the coins back in the bag, then put that in her leather bag that she kept on her belt. Gunhild strolled through the marketplace, wondering what to do next. The possibilities were many, but there were still some limits. It was September, and the good weather wouldn't last forever, but she could still probably get a few more weeks in. It felt impossibly strange to her that she might buy almost anything she saw around her or go anywhere she wanted. The difficulty was that she didn't know what she wanted anymore. As she strolled through the marketplace, browsing at the stalls and wondering what to do about food, she heard voices she was sure she recognized. No, it wasn't the voices. It was the words. Someone was speaking Danish. She began to move quickly around the market, trying not to look frantic, but not wanting to let whoever it was get away. She heard the voice again and saw three men speaking to the jeweler who had sold her the jet weeks ago. Two carried bundles and waited while the other struggled to make himself understood to the jeweler. Occasionally the two would speak to each other in Danish, which is what she had overheard. As she approached them from behind, she broke into a wide smile. One was a tall young man with blonde hair and a short beard. She came up behind him and, tapping him on the shoulder, said, Go then Morgan, Osbjorn. Osbjorn turned to see who had spoken, and when he recognized Gunhild, he stood open-mouthed, unable to speak. You remember me, I hope, she said, smiling. Remember you? Of course! Gunhild, how are you? How did you get here? Over the sea, she said. Same as you, I assume. Do you need some help with translation? Gunhild was able to help the communication between Osbjorn's men and the merchant, and she negotiated a price of twenty silver pennies and four strands of glass beads in exchange for three walrus tusks. 
Osbjorn and his men were very pleased, and Osbjorn stumbled over his words, trying to explain to them how he knew Gunhild. She followed them out of the town to where they and the rest of the crew had camped downriver, and Gunhild finally managed to get some food. As they sat around a campfire, Osbjorn told her how he had bought a boat with the money from his father, and recruited a crew in Ripa, and then in Hythabu, then sailed north in search of walrus ivory and pelts from reindeer, foxes, and seals. They had been lucky. They didn't encounter bad storms, they managed to keep warm, and they found some villages in Lapland where people were eager to trade. Now they were trying to stop at the biggest towns from Aiden down to Hamwich while the weather was good, and then return home. After he told his story, she told hers, and he and the crew marveled at the journey she and Yadath had made. It felt good to be back among people who spoke her language. She wasn't constantly grasping for words or struggling with grammar. She could make jokes easily again. Osbjorn's men were happy to talk to her, and they shared information about rivers, ports, tides, and winds. Their boat was a beautiful thing, with five benches where two men could row side by side. It was filled with skins, furs, and reindeer antlers. There were also wooden chests, probably full of supplies and whatever valuable things they had been trading for. It looked like a sound boat and a good crew, and she told Osbjorn so. "'There's room for you,' Osbjorn said. "'Thank you, but no,' Gunhild answered. "'But what have you heard about my mother's farm?' "'Not much,' said Osbjorn apologetically. "'I know Ragnolf still comes and goes. "'Your mother and brothers are well, so far as I know. "'I could take a message to them.' "'Tell them I'm thinking of them,' said Gunhild. "'Actually, there is someone I do need you to take something to. "'My uncle Ivar. I have his boat.' "'You want us to take his boat back?' "'No, but tell me a good price for it. "'It's about fifteen feet long, good mast and sail, two sets of oars, meant for fishing.' "'I can't believe you made it across the sea in that thing,' mused Osbjorn. "'It held up,' said Gunhild. "'What would you pay for it?' Osbjorn considered and said, I saw a boat like that trade in Ripa for a team of oxen and a plow. I would probably pay two hundred silver coins. Gunhild got out the bag that the English thane had given her earlier. She poured out ten gold coins into her hand, and Osborne and the others stared in awe. How many of these? she asked. Osborne pursed his lips and counted quickly on his fingers. I would say seven of those coins. I think I should make it eight, for interest on the loan, said Gunhild, and she counted out eight coins and handed them to Osbjorn. My uncle's name is Ivar. He lives with Bera on the river near Ripa. Give him my thanks. I'll do that, said Osbjorn. Gunhild spent the night at their camp, and they fed her again and gave her a blanket. The idea of joining them was tempting, but the more she thought about it, the more she knew she couldn't. She was up at dawn and thanked them all again before setting off. Osbjorn stumbled quickly to his feet and said, Wait! He looked around at his crew and blushed, then quickly walked with Gunhild away from camp back toward the town. When they were out of earshot, he stopped and took both her hands, as he had done once before the previous year. It was a year ago I asked you, he began. Your father prevented it then, but I think it's safe to say you answer to no one now. I can provide for you, and if you want to come sailing, I wouldn't stop you. Gunhild, do you still want to marry me? Gunhild had seen this coming, and smiled warmly, but sadly. You're a good man, Osbjorn, she said, and you did have my heart last summer, it's true. But a lot has changed since then. I understand, said Osbjorn. At least let me take you home. That's not my home anymore, she said. I have someone waiting for me, and I'm going there now. She stood on her toes and kissed Osbjorn quickly, then released his hands and turned to head back toward Yoverwich and the pier where her boat was moored. It was rightfully hers now, and it felt good to have that weight off her shoulders. As she neared the city, she picked up her pace and smiled at the thought of the days sailing ahead of her. If the wind cooperated, she would be back with Yadith in only a couple of days. <laughs>